rolling. Okay, for several years, uh, we've kicked around the idea of making a video for uh, Western movie makers and Western uh, fiction writers so that they could avoid um, mistakes, anachronisms, and understand how guns that were actually used on the Western frontier in America work and how they're properly handled. The tragic events of the last month on the set of uh, movie Rust um, argues that the time has come that something like this is really needed. Now, our purpose here is not to second-guess law enforcement to attempt to affix blame or tell you what happened. It's simply to show you how these guns can be safely handled and how they should be safely handled. That said, one thing I want to tell you is that we have checked all of these firearms to make sure that they are in safe condition and unloaded. Um, we will check them several times during the course of this filming. What you're probably not going to see us do, though, is check them much on camera because, to be perfectly honest, watching two guys check firearms to make sure they're not loading, loaded is not uh, going to make a riveting video. We will show you how to check to see whether these guns are safely unloaded, but we won't show you our process of continually checking them as we're making the video. That said, what we're going to talk about today is the Colt family of single action pistols. Now, let's start by explaining what the term single action means. And it covers both the Colt muzzle-loading cap and ball pistols, the conversion of the Colt muzzle-loading cap and ball pistols, and the Colt single action firearms. All right, this is the iconic cowboy pistol. And this is an actual old original Colt that had some Western use. To check to make sure this gun is loaded, you pull the hammer back to half cock, and we'll explain that in a minute. And I goofed up there, so let's actually put it on half cock. And you rotate the cylinder, and as you can see, there's nothing in it. Now there are six holes in the cylinder. All right, so this one's unloaded. All right, what single action means is that every time the gun is to be fired, the hammer has to be pulled all the way back in this position, and the cylinder rotates and places a cartridge under the firing pin of the gun, and to discharge the gun, you need to pull the trigger, and the hammer will fall, and the gun will go off. To shoot the gun again, you have to recock it, and each time you fire it until the gun is empty, you need to recock it. Now, single action is opposed to a double action pistol. Like this old antique Smith & Wesson pocket pistol. Popularly known as the lemon squeezer. And it has a concealed hammer to avoid snagging it in your pocket. And one pull of the trigger will turn the cylinder and raise and lower the hammer firing the gun. There's a different type of double action revolver, and this is the iconic cop gun, the Smith & Wesson Military and Police Model 10, once again empty, and it can be fired double action by pulling the trigger, the cylinder turns, the hammer rises and falls, or single action by cocking it for each shot. Now, when Sam Colt invented his revolver back in the 1830s, he was familiar with the double action principle. We know that both from his patent drawings and from his models that he kept in a collection. Ultimately, he decided to manufacture single action guns, and I think there were three reasons for that. One is simply simplified the design and made manufacture easier and cheaper. Secondly, the firearm was more robust, had fewer parts and fewer service problems. But the most important factor in the black powder era was it made the gun a whole heck of a lot easier to maintain. It's desirable in 
a muzzle-loading gun using black powder to clean it completely after it's used. This is a Colt 1860 Army revolver. It had wide use in the American Civil War. And this open top design, there's a little wedge here that can be driven out and the pistol disassembles very easily. The lock part parts can be taken apart with a screwdriver. And it's one of the reasons the Colt revolver met with such great success was that it's very easily cleaned. When we went to the later cartridge revolvers, and this is a variation of the Colt uh, single action revolver, single action army that's known as the Bisley, it was a target model, and it had a different grip, bigger grip for easier handling and a different hammer for better cocking for target shooting. Uh, and this was a popular Western gun. This particular gun, um, if you examine it closely, you can actually see the grain of the holster, leather holster liner that it was kept in uh, when it was carried probably almost continuously during its uh, working life. We put the gun on half cock, check it to make sure it's unloaded. And the way that you clean these guns is uh, the older black powder models had a screw you remove. This one has a little push pin. You just push to one side, remove the cylinder pin, which sometimes can be a bit bulky, and the cylinder comes out, and you can clean the gun, clean the barrel, clean the cylinder. Now, we've got the cylinder out, let me mention that one of the absolute most safest ways to handle these guns is to take the cylinder out and the gun is still able to be cocked and fired. It's just you don't have the cylinder in there. Um, Elmer Keith, who was an expert on the subject of single action firearms, used to use this method when he was demonstrating self-defense techniques that involved actually pointing a gun at a real person. Because there's no way that this gun can be discharged. The part that handles the cartridges is absent from the gun. And that would be a technique that would be very useful to use in, for example, rehearsals where you don't need the utmost in realism and you can absolutely be assured of being safe and everybody can see that this gun is not in a condition to be fired. So, let's talk about safely handling this gun and how it's loaded and unloaded. First off, every Colt Model 1873 single action revolver and all the variants have a system by which the hammer works. There are three notches in this hammer. The first notch is the safety notch, and the purpose of it is to pull the firing pin off of the primer of a cartridge. The primer is the part of the cartridge that holds a pressure-sensitive explosive. The firing pin whacks the primer. That creates a burst of fire, which communicates to the powder in the cartridge causes an explosion that pushes the actual bullet or projectile out the barrel. Now, the important thing to know about this safety notch is it is present. It is absolutely positively not to be trusted. Uh, what was found out relatively early on is that having this gun on its so-called safety notch with a live cartridge underneath the firing pin is a hazardous condition. One thing that can happen is if the gun is dropped and it lands on the hammer, it may break the safety notch and force the hammer past um, its notch position into firing and the gun is accidentally discharged. Another accident that happened in the old days is that when a gun was carried in a holster, much like this one, and the revolver was placed on the safety notch, a cowboy would be wearing this around his waist, approximately like that, and he'd take his stirrup, one of those real heavy old wooden stirrups, and throw it up on top of the saddle to reach underneath the horse and tighten the girth strap. Well, when he did that, the horse would occasionally jerk, the stirrup would flop down, and if you were unlucky, 
it would hit that hammer spur, shear off the safety notch, and fire the gun if you had a cartridge underneath the firing pin. Now, if you were lucky, you walked away from it with a limp, which explains why there were so many hopalongs and gimpies and other nicknames back then. And that's why Chester on Gunsmoke probably had a limp. So absolutely, positively, do not trust this. All right, the second hammer position is the half cock notch. Whoops, we went past it there. And this is a position that allows the hammer to stay where it can't be pulled off by the trigger and the cylinder to rotate. Once again, this is not to be trusted as a safety device because it can be pulled off or if the gun is dropped, it can result in a discharge. To load these guns, you flip open this loading gate and you stick a cartridge in the hole. This is a very simple operation. Now, you want to end up with no cartridge under the uh, firing pin when you're finished. So what you do is you put a cartridge in the first hole, you skip the second hole, and then you continue to place cartridges in so the entire gun is loaded. You'll have five cartridges in the gun when it's loaded, and when you cock the hammer the last time, it'll come up on the empty chamber and you will drop the hammer gently on that empty chamber. That way the gun can be carried in fully loaded regardless whether it's loaded with bulleted cartridges or blank cartridges with no danger of an accidental discharge from it being dropped. That is the only safe way to carry a loaded Colt single action revolver. In the percussion guns, there are little pins designed between the chambers to receive a notch that is cut in the bottom of the hammer. And it was intended that the hammer be lowered on one of those pins and carried that way. This proved to be a very, very bad idea because what would happen as the gun was carried, particularly carried on horse, is that this would bounce up and down in the holster and it'd eventually rotate until the hammer was resting on a loaded chamber. So once again, the only safe way to carry these guns is on an empty chamber, essentially making them a five shooter. Uh, the way these guns are loaded is there is no safety notch on these. They're placed on half cock, which allows you to revolve the cylinder. You have a flask of powder and you put a powder charge in each chamber that you want to load you put a bullet in and then this thing is a ramrod and you ram the cartridges home the primers and we don't have any with us unfortunately are a little copper cap and they sit on top of this piece that's called a nipple and once again, the caps are pressure sensitive, and when the trigger is pulled and the hammer falls, they discharge uh, the gun. Now let's talk about cartridges for a minute. And the proper name for them is cartridges. The sure sign of an amateur that doesn't know what they're talking about is bullets. The bullet is the projectile portion of the cartridge. The cartridge has other components. They are the case, the primer, the powder, and the bullet. These guns were chambered for a variety of cartridges. The most famous one is probably the Colt 45. However, guns were also made in 3840, 4440, 3220, and a variety of other uh, less popular cartridges. The reason for the chamberings in 3840, 4440, and 3220 was that these were cartridges that the very popular model 1873 Winchester rifle was chambered in. And it allowed a man to carry 
only one kind of cartridge that fit both his rifle and his pistol. So, both of these pistols were intended as companions to a Winchester 3840 rifle, just like this one. This is a 3220 Colt Lightning. This particular gun uh, was used as a guard gun on one of the Harriman railroads back in the Butch Cassidy days. And it used this cartridge, and the guards were probably also armed with 3220 revolvers. Now, what I want to get across to you is that even though these cartridges look pretty dinky compared to, say, the 4570, which was the standard U.S. Army round at the time, they are extremely powerful and capable of doing great damage to whatever they hit. As a matter of fact, the 45 Long Colt up until the 1930s with the development of uh, the 357 um, Magnum in its black powder loading was the most powerful handgun cartridge on the market. And it's still a pretty powerful number. If you get hit with this thing, you're going to be in a world of hurt. These cartridges likewise are powerful, powerful cartridges. They were intended in the rifles they were made as big game hunting cartridges. And it's said probably truthfully that more animals, large and small, and more men, bad and good, have been killed with the uh, 3840 and the 4040, 4440 cartridge than any other one in history. Um, these are nothing to mess around with. Just for perspective, any of these cartridges, with the exception of the 3220, which was really intended as a small game cartridge, are more powerful than the 9mm, which is so currently popular in high capacity automatic pistols. Anyway, that's just a short summary of how to handle these pistols carefully. Once again, don't point them, loaded or unloaded, at anything you don't want to hit. Always assume, until you have verified otherwise, that they are loaded, and you will stay out of trouble. It doesn't take but a moment to put the gun on half cock and spin the cylinder to indicate whether it's loaded or unloaded. You can also tell by looking in the front of the cylinder, although I don't advise looking in the front of a loaded gun, a cylinder that's loaded, you'll be able to see the bullets. Um, be careful. These are powerful firearms. One of the reasons they're so powerful is that, unpleasant as it is to talk about, back in the 19th century, military weapons had to be capable of killing or disabling a horse. A man in a cavalry action whose horse is shot is essentially out of combat. An artillery piece, which was moved on the battlefield with horses, if the horses were disabled, was essentially out of action. And supply trains, ammunition trains, and wagon trains of all sorts were dependent on horse-borne transportation. Disable the horses, you prevented the enemy from moving them. So when the U.S. Army wanted a pistol cartridge, it wanted something powerful enough to take down a horse. These are not to be treated as toys, okay? And if you keep that in mind, you'll do fine. Thanks for listening. Hope this helped you.